Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship. Why are you laughing? <laughs> you know, I've never seen me in a baseball cap with a robe. I got this this morning, so I thought I'd share it with you. It says, Pastor Warning, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. <laughs> it was very, it was from Bill Cox. It was, it, was, it was very appropriate. I picked on three people in the first service. Hopefully I'll behave in this service and not do that. I made people speak when they, or told stories about what they've done. And so today we welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship. We're grateful today to have with us Jacqueline returning as a flutist. Um, she, when, did, when was the concert? Uh, I can't remember now. In October. It was in October. We had her here for a concert, and so she offered to play for us, and uh, Mel Z and Jacqueline got connected, and so we're grateful to have you uh, help us with music today. Uh, today we continue the sermon series on the soul of money. This is our third week and uh, looking at this whole invitation of what it means to look at our resources, especially financial resources in light of our faith. And the story of scarcity that we considered last week, we talked about uh, the fear of scarcity or the myths of scarcity. This is based on the work of Lynn Twist. Today we're looking at three truths of sufficiency. And so Lynn Twist says this in her book, The Soul of Money. She, she identifies three uh, items as, as truths about money. Money is like water. It can be a conduit of positive energy when we use it for good. What we appreciate appreciates appreciative inquiry, meaning, you know, if you look at uh, commodities sometimes, when you think if there's no value to it, if people don't want to buy something, it doesn't have a lot of value, financial uh, value. But if people want it, then it becomes very uh, valuable. Same would be with our uh, life resources, too. Uh, collaboration creates prosperity. So sometimes we think that we have to do it on our own, and sufficiency reminds us that we're created for community, and whatever we do is done better when we, are, we do it together. And so today, thinking about this uh, theme, one of the examples I want to lift up to you is from uh, this documentary, which I've mentioned before, The Human Footprint by uh, Shane Campbell Staten. He uh, is the son of Sheila Campbell, Many of you have seen her here as a guest preacher, and she is now the pastor at East Bethany uh, Presbyterian Church. But uh, Shane, her son, came to Rochester and was promoting and talking about this work as a biologist. Uh, he talks about this uh, connection between human beings and nature and the environment and the impact uh, we have on the environment, but also the impact the environment has on us. And in the clip we're going to watch, this is from an episode where he talked about urban development. And we, didn't, we tend to think whenever we have big cities, uh, there's a lot of concrete and a lot of buildings and nature gets pushed out. If you go even to places like California, uh, where people are, keep pushing into the wilderness, where the mountains, she, uh, 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 Charlene is shaking her head because you probably have seen it so much, where people have built up in the mountains and different places to live, but they pushed out nature and wildlife. Uh, but this, in this example, uh, he gives, he goes to Singapore. And he shows a different model. So we have uh, this imagination that, it, that there's only one way of uh, urban development where it pushes out nature. And in this example, he gives a different vision. Is it your first time in Singapore? It is. Man, this place, it's, I've never seen anything like it. It's incredible. If you ask Pearl Chi, she'll tell you it's no miracle. It's all part of the plan. We are challenging ourselves as architects, whether yeah. we can design better. We are creating a lot of concrete uh, 
buildings. It's like a concrete jungle, but but we, we really want to bring the the jungle in. Pearl is the architect who designed the Kampong Admiralty, the building we're standing in now. Our design concept, it's a very unique uh, combination. We we actually have elderly housing, public housing, okay. uh, combined with healthcare, which is a medical center, uh, commercial, and some social programs, and a food court, yeah. Oh, wow. So that's why it's not gated. It's okay. very open. Anybody can actually come in and use the facilities, yeah. Singapore is the third most densely populated city in the world. The entire country is an island with only 281 square miles of land, but five and a half million people live here. In a city this dense, you wouldn't expect much room for nature, but it's like they say, where there's a will, there's a way. And by will, I mean law. Legislation enables it to happen. The building took the land. So we need to do replacement. The legislation actually requires a building to give back 100% uh, landscape. 100% oh. of the site footprint has to be replaced into the building. Like every square inch of like green space that you take up, you have to put, put, back, put in, back in into yeah. the building somehow. In, into the building. A few years after completing the building, Pearl's firm surveyed the animal life in Kampong Admiralty's gardens. 50 different species had moved in. This development is a microcosm of what's happening all over Singapore. It's not just one building or designer or architecture firm. The whole city is teeming with life. As a biologist, I think a lot about, you know, sort of wildlife, specifically in urban spaces, right? And how urban environments can be very stressful, very different environments. But your job has been the opposite, right? To make urban environments very much like wild environments in a, in a lot of ways. What is your approach to increasing biodiversity in a, in a space like this? So visually, we want to have some interest in the landscape. And secondly, we introduce a lot of edibles. So oh. you see a lot of fruit trees actually yeah. here. Yeah. So that attracts um, the birds, mammals and insects. Um, and also because we did it in a cascading form, so it's actually quite connected all the way to, to the ground floor. Okay. Yeah, so the, the landscape is actually connecting. We have a system of um, collecting the water as well. That's why the cascading planters, the, the water, uh, water actually get filtered through all the way. Just by gravity. By gravity, yeah. So it's an interesting concept to look at harmony between nature and human beings and looking at a creative way. I love the, he interviews government officials, different people with the same vision to see the world be uh, a place where you act out of abundance instead of scarcity, out of sharing and working together instead of feeling like, oh, it's, if, it's only one way or the other. If we have to build up the place, we have to take down nature. And it, it's a very uh, intriguing concept where you change that vision of, of scarcity into a, a vision of abundance. Um, so today I want to invite us to allow the Holy Spirit to engage our imagination as we listen to the scriptures, as we sing, as we pray, to open our hearts to what that might mean for us, especially in the season of Thanksgiving. So I invite you to take a deep breath. Prepare your hearts for worship. And let us join in the call to worship together. We gather today to give thanks to the Lord with our whole hearts. We glorify God's loving presence. May our worship bring joy and healing to our world. Amen. And please stand and join me in singing the first hymn, hymn number 559, We Gather Together.
And for our gratitude moment today, we are uh, celebrating the abundance of God and the generosity of this community in supporting Crossroads House. Today, they are, uh, if you haven't gone to their sale, they still have it open for us. But also today, I want to highlight, uh, so it's in the fellowship hall, but I want to highlight today the little free pantry and the outreach committee. And I'm coming your way, Kelly. <laughs> I'm picking on you. See, <laughs> you want to tell what happened this week? Uh, sure. Um, I think it was just yesterday. Yeah, right? yeah, a couple days ago. Yeah. Um, Rula forwarded a voicemail to the members of the outreach committee and um, Jen from the Little Free Pantry um, to help a gentleman that was in need of a place to stay over the weekend and food. So the Little Free Pantry um, was able to get him a hotel room last night. Outreach committee got him a hotel room for tonight. And then tomorrow, um, he will be going with um, a couple of the people from Little Free Pantry to get some additional help, food, and he also has a job interview. So Great. And see, that's I love this. This is part of the help fund. Some of you uh, that it got combined into the outreach committee. Um, and it's very interesting that it's not just the handout to say, okay, here's one night, but now they're really following up and doing this work together to help someone uh, in the long term. So it's a beautiful partnership. I'm really grateful for the work. Uh, for many, many years, we give credit to Kay Federley. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I called Kay, you know, different times of the day and say, Kay, there's someone in need and, and Kay would just run and do whatever it took. So it's wonderful to see it growing. Um, so Kay and I celebrate and rejoice. <laughs> so we give thanks to God. invited to share any joys or concerns that we may have. If you'd like to share anything, uh, please raise your hand and I'll bring a microphone to you. One uh, prayer that was requested is by Nancy Post for David Post, who is in the hospital, uh, not doing all that well. Uh, this was as of yesterday. So uh, prayers for him um, and for the whole family. And today was the, is, was supposed to be their anniversary celebration. It's his so birthday it's his birthday coming up on the 23rd. He, he's going to turn to, uh, 90. A person who is sort of a member of our congregation, of whom I am very fond, had a health scare this week, but he's okay. So I'm very grateful for that. His name shall be anonymous. <laughs> I'll give you his name. His name was Mike Stewart. Uh, we had, uh, we did have a big scare. Um, for those of, of you who do not know, Mike Stewart is my husband, and we had on Monday a uh, little scare. It was a big scare as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he went into diabetic coma. His insulin level was uh, too high for what he was taking, and so he ended up, uh, I mean, passing out and not being able to wake up and so his blood sugar was 36 and so uh, grateful for the neighborhood I mean I had neighbors I had I mean it was like a a war zone at our house when when they found out and I was actually grateful too I was on I was going to do uh, come to church for bible study and something nudged me to say oh check on him he doesn't look like he's just taking a nap and then all the response. And then there was someone who, was, who led the Bible study. So perfect. Oh, it worked out in, in all directions. And he's doing fine. He, they adjusted his medications. But uh, very grateful for all the love of, and the neighborhood. We have a retired cop as our neighbor. Uh, let's see, in the house, he's on our left side hand. And um, 
he was listening to the scanner because all of a sudden he just barges in. I'm like, how did you find out? Because I listened to the scanner. So he heard it was the, do the house next door. So he came and was very, very helpful. So we're very grateful. Any other? Yes. Also, there is a woman who has been coming to our church. She, she's Presbyterian from Caledonia, uh, Lisa Morella. She asked uh, for prayers for her mother-in-law as well. Well, I have a joy. I became a great-grandmother. I heard. Congratulations. <laughs> um, her name is Kennedy Main, and she weighed 4 pounds, 14 ounces. Oh, so little. But here, nonetheless. Yes. Yes. Doug, you want to tell us about Wendy? Just uh, continued prayers for Wendy on her healing. She's doing better uh, day by day, so it was nice to see that she could sit up in uh, not a lot of pain. So she just needs to keep on the medicine. So prayers for continued healing and recovery. Um, this week, my brother-in-law, David, was moved from the hospital to the Livingston County um, rehab nursing home and unfortunately he also now has tested positive for COVID. <sighs> COVID strikes again all the time now. Every week, it's funny how it's been happening too, but we continue to pray for him, but every week I hear about a couple people in our church who have, you know, been exposed to COVID or got COVID as well. Anybody else? Yes. Sandy Dix, okay. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, she sent me something yesterday, so she okay. seems okay. But it's so weird we, sh here. we should ask her, where are you? How dare you? <laughs> Everybody traveling and the Thanksgiving holiday to be joyous and bring people together. Um, it's amazing how this time of year, I mean, some people are traveling far, some people are traveling just a little bit, but the whole spirit of coming together is, is beautiful for us. So we will join our hearts together in prayer. Let us join in prayer. God of each and all, generous beyond measure to each and all. Look kindly on us, deal gently with us. You ask us to be your agents in the world, and so we pray now for those who are in difficulty and need to know your love and concern for them. You know by name the worried, the betrayed, the dying, and the hungry. And we take a few moments of silence to bring our hearts together and to open our lives to the mystery and wonder of God's presence. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So today we look at this theme, but just from a different angle. Last week we talked about the three uh, myths of scarcity, the things that we tend to think about as the truth. But today we're actually talking about the truths of sufficiency, so the opposite. So the myths of scarcity, according to Lynn Twist, are, any of you who are here remember, there's not enough for everyone, so more is better, and then that's just the way it is. And so today, to think about a different way of life, uh, we're going to look at the story of Jesus when he begins his ministry and when he goes to the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And then he reads from the scriptures, from the writings of the uh, prophet Isaiah. And then he proclaims something that makes people really upset. And so in, in that spirit, this, uh, I saw this meme recently. It said, remember, the Bible verses about a talking snake are literal. But the part about forgiving everyone's debt is just a metaphor. <laughs> now, it's a pastor's humor. <laughs> and so I was like, ah, oh. I saw it, but I, I thought it was really clever. Of course, it's the idea that we... Uh, like certain things about the faith, and we all pick and choose the things that make us uncomfortable. We just say, oh, it's just a, you know, it's an ideal. Whenever I, I speak with people about, okay, what if you're really, if you, you're taking the Bible literally, what about forgiving debts? What about forgiving everyone's uh, mistakes? Because Jesus talks about that very clearly. And people say, well, is this just the ideal of things, not really what uh, we can take into everyday life? You can't practice that. But the invitation is to look. How, why do we do that? Why do we struggle with the things that especially relate to money and resources? And to know that the people of Jesus at the time, they struggled as well. They're like us. We can judge them and think, you know, how could they want to throw Jesus off of a cliff? But we ourselves struggle with the same issues. And so one of the issues that we've been looking at is that we get wounded from an early age around money. Somehow our worth is connected to our money. So the more money I get paid, the more valuable I may feel. Or the more money I can afford to use to buy certain uh, materials or supplies or cars or homes, then the more successful I am. When we use these terms, we're usually referring to someone who is able to make a lot of money. Or they're carrying their own weight or they're supporting a lot of people. You just think about it in that way. So we assign value to people who have more money instead of looking at your value is really for who you are. Money is, is just a part of, you know, kind of like your giftedness. When you think about some of us have certain gifts, some of us can really uh, do math, some of us can't do any math, some of us can do beautiful music, create beautiful music, like Melzi and Jacqueline and where's Elaine? She left. Oh. I know Mark, she didn't ask for prayers for him, but Mark is still struggling to recover from uh, his cough. But you think about these gifts, you don't think, oh, Melzi is better than me. I mean, she, I, I admire Melzi a lot, but just because she has different gifts doesn't mean she's better, but we do that with money. We do that exactly with money. We think of some people as better than others because of money. And sometimes we, we reflect that about ourselves. And we struggle, so we have to hoard more in order to, uh, to connect our worth to more money or a sense of safety. But here we have in this story uh, Jesus challenging his people. So he goes into the temple and to the synagogue, and then he's preaching a sermon. And so let's listen to a part of this, what, what he quoted from or what he read uh, from the, uh, the prophet Isaiah. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In your hearing. And so at first, people enjoyed what Jesus had to say. They're like, wow, listen to his reading probably, his eloquence. He's telling about the fulfillment of the vision of the prophet. Uh, they listened to a good oration and, and a significant sermon. But then he began to challenge them to practice this stuff that he was talking about. And then he told them that they were being hypocrites because he said those people on the outside of the faith, they were doing better jo a better job than those who were insiders. Somehow, you know, God showed mercy to those on the outside more than the insiders because the insiders were hypocritical. So you can imagine the reaction. How do you think people reacted? Those of you who have read the story many times, you know. What, they were enraged. How could he say that? And so this goes into the rest of the story. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? So you start, you know, saying, oh, can't be that good because he, he's, you know, a lowly person. He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb. Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you, you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So see how he's bringing uh, two examples where God showed mercy to outsiders. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill to, on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. It's a really incredible story when you think this is just the beginning of his ministry, and he is at his hometown where you would think they would think, oh, this is a great preacher coming through but not so when he's challenging them. And one of the concepts that was really challenging for them is what he said about the year of the Lord's favor. Now, for us, we may get lost a little bit hearing that. What was that about? And this, is, this takes us back to Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 15. That's what uh, Isaiah was referring to, the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was an important year, an important part of the practice of justice in the community. God uh, took the people out of uh, Egypt, out of slavery, and showed them a different way to be. So they were supposed to have practices, not just the Ten Commandments, but a lot of practices that would show them peace. And these practices included this. Sabbath, so every seventh day of the week, they were supposed to rest from labor and from work. And every seven years, they were supposed to practice a sabbatical year. Some of us hear sabbatical year, what do we think of? Vacation, Vacation that's right. And so we think, especially like uh, sometimes uh, professors or pastors, they take a sabbatical year every seven years. And, but this was a different concept. This was the idea. After seven years, they would take a year of rest, a year where they would not plant, they would not harvest, they would just store enough for the whole community to have enough. And the idea is to also forgive debts. If somebody incurred debts during those six years, uh, then they would be forgiven. 
And so and then Jubilee was the ultimate celebration. So this was the seventh uh, sabbatical year. So seven times seven is 49. So 49, sometimes people say, well, it was the 49th year. Sometimes uh, it was the 50th year. We don't really know exactly which year they settled on. But the idea is the same, is that with a Jubilee year, the invitation is to let go of the debts uh, so this is, this is the instruction from, from God's vision for the people. Forgive all debts, free all the slaves, let the land rest, return the birthright land to those who lost it. Due to hardship, to whatever mismanagement, it doesn't matter. And you know, like uh, in the scriptures, in those uh, commandments, so, uh, God was saying, you know, even if you think somebody mismanaged their resources or they fell on hard times and you think, oh, oh the sabbatical year is coming up, I'm not going to lend them anything because then I have to forgive them. And God says, do not harden your heart like that. And so what do you think? How do you think if, if Jesus stood here before us today and said, yeah, let's practice this stuff. How would we react? I mean, we may not take him to the hill and, and throw him off the cliff, but think about how we would react. And be honest. Yes, Ruth. I think we first figure out how our own stuff is going. Okay. And like you were saying, decide can I or shouldn't I? Mm hmm. What Jesus is saying, yeah. So depending on our perception of our needs, we may say to Jesus, eh, not so fast. It's not easy. This stuff is hard. And this is when people say, well, faith is hard. I'm like, yeah, huh? No kidding. It's hard. It's challenging. If you really take it seriously, not literally, but if you take the faith seriously, it makes you wrestle with concepts about life, about faith, about money, about resources, about our time, what we give energy to. So it's not a surprise that this, these people said, hey, we imagined, I mean, if I'm speaking for them, of course, you can only imagine what they thought, but you can imagine that, that they were living under uh, occupation and their social experiment of being the people of God had kind of failed because now they have the Romans. And they imagined if they had a Messiah that would come and overthrow the Romans, then everything would be fine. Now think about it for us today. What's the equivalent for us today when we imagine that peace will come if we elect the right government? It's, a, it's the same mindset, you know, it's like if we could just fix the top, things would be fine. And does it prove to be true? Every election cycle, we have the same thing. We think, oh, they, these people we elect, they should fix the system, they should establish justice, they should help us find peace, we shouldn't have poor people on the streets, we should be able to figure out how to not be engaged in so much war, all the things we hope for. But then it doesn't work. And notice, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican president or a, a Democratic president or a Democratic House or whatever, it's, it ends up being kind of in the same way. A lot of different aspects, but, but pretty much the same results. We keep getting stuck in the same cycles. And so to look at this and to think, and the same was happening for these people. They might have practiced this at first when they came out of Egypt and they're like, okay, you know, the social experiment of, of living on, on our own and living as God has called us to live. But as time went on, as time went on, people are afraid when it comes to money. We have this fear. We have this attachment. And to practice this just sounds really crazy. And it's funny, I was talking to someone from uh, the first service who was telling me he works, he volunteers at the Restore, uh, Habitat for Humanity Restore. And he was telling me that they got these huge uh, shipments of materials, and so they decided in order, because they couldn't uh, have it in the store, and so they would sell uh, 
materials in a, in a box for $2 a box. It didn't matter what was in the box. It was just take the box and, uh, for $2. He was saying that it was so distressing to see people that were well off would come and take the, the $2 boxes and then go and sell them online. And it's like, oh, and I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, it's not easy. This stuff is hard. This stuff is risky. And this stuff is not always experimented with in terms of daily life. We know that as human beings, we know the system we have. It's built on, you know, like a lot of greed and a lot of fear. But we know it, it's working sort of. We don't know if this stuff would work. We don't know if any of this, I mean, this sounds, some, some people might say, well, this sounds like communism. And we don't like hearing that word. We think it's terrible and, or socialism or whatever. You put a label on it and you dismiss it. But I hope today you, you will look at it deeper and think about yourself, what you can practice, what needs to change in you about money, about resources. This is not a call to go out and, and tell everybody else what to do. Because it's easy to go that, in that direction and say, well, if they could just live like I do, then we'll be all fine. Or if they follow my orders or my vision. But I think Jesus was preaching to people to say, you know, this stuff you can practice yourself. When you hold a grudge against someone, let it go. When you are fearful around money, check it out. What's going on with you? Why are you, why are you living in that mindset? What's go, what, what wounding needs uh, to be healed by the Spirit of God? And so the invitation is to consider the truth of sufficiency. The truth is that we are enough, just as we are. Today, we belong. We belong to God. We belong to each other. This world is abundant. Despite all the evidence that we think of, despite all the data that shows us, oh, there's not enough. I think it starts with each of us believing that we are enough, that we have enough, that the world around us is abundant enough, and that people do make the right decision a lot of the time. And we can change for, for the best. Twist says this about sufficiency. Sufficiency isn't a measure of barely enough or more than enough. Sufficiency isn't an amount at all. It is an experience, a context we generate, a declaration of knowing that there is enough and that we are enough. So it's, it, the sufficiency, again, it starts with us, with each one of us, really allowing the Holy Spirit to remind us that we are enough as it is today. And that life, even though we have challenges, doesn't mean life is always going to go with the way we think. God provides us with amazing things. And even if we end up on the other side, the generosity of God doesn't stop there. We receive the gifts of love on the other side as well. So today the invitation is to accept these truths of sufficiency, not just as a concept, but something we seek to live by. Think about what do you appreciate in life? Think about the things that really matter for, to you. Think of the things you uh, teach children, grandchildren, friends. What, this week is a perfect week for this. Thanksgiving, what's it about? It's about coming together and saying thank you for the generosity of life. Thank you we're here. And thank you for those who have gone before us. I know Thanksgiving for us, for my family, is going to be a little tough this year. Because, you know, it's the first year without my brother. And I know his family is really struggling. But even within that, there is that sense of deep gratitude for the gifts of life, for the gifts of the people who have gone before us. The last couple of days, I don't know why Roxy has been so much on my mind. And especially whenever I try to go to sleep, I keep thinking of Roxy. I'm like, Roxy, stop it. I'm trying to sleep. But, you know, I, I, I have turned it. It's funny. As I was thinking about this, I'm like, you know, I'm going to turn that. Instead of the dread and the sense of deep loss that I still feel, I'm going to focus on the gratitude for all that she's done and given and shared. And it really helps. It really shifts my perspective from feeling like, oh, I'm lo I lost her. I mean, even the language we use, I lost someone. And, and 
This is not to belittle the pain of, of uh, grief, but to also put it, hold it in the larger context of thanksgiving in life. And so today, I want to invite us to consider where we see the flow of money in our lives. Do, are we intentional about it? Twist asks these questions. I want you to, to think about them for yourself. Do you know the flow of money in your life? Are you mindful of how it comes to you? Are you uh, consciously allocating where you want your money to go? And not out of a sense of fear, but out of a sense of alignment with your values, with your love, with your connections. And so I, I want to give you some great hope, hopefully, this, uh, this message, uh, to think about this is possible. And sometimes we think the kingdom of God is going to come to us in these big, grandiose ways. But the kingdom of God, remember, what does Jesus, what, uh, one of my favorite parables is about what? A little tiny mustard seed. That's how the kingdom of God comes to us sometimes. It only takes a little mustard seed for us to really feel uh, the abundance of God. So uh, I want to leave us with the idea of thinking of nature as one of the great resources that God has blessed us with. And we live in an area where it's abundant. You can, if you're feeling that sense of scarcity, go out, whatever, whatever the cause might be, it might not be money. It might be a sense of grief or a sense of lack or a sense of, uh, you know, being worthless or whatever you are struggling with. Go out into nature and let the abundance of God speak to you. One of my uh, favorite resources on this is by a Potawatomi woman by the name of Robin uh, Wall Kimmerer. She's a botanist and she's actually in, uh, in New York in Sy- Syracuse. Uh, she wrote this book about 10 years ago, Braiding Sweetgrass, and the idea of looking at nature and seeing the abundance in nature and the beauty and the mysteries of life unfolding. And so she talks about this concept of defeating Wendigo, which is a, a, a native uh, legend about this monster. And she talks about this monster, she says, the hungry monster of greed that lurks all around and sometimes inside of us. And so in order to defeat or transform Wendigo, she says, practice a gratitude and appreciation of the gifts of the earth. Instead of being so driven by an economy of commodities, we are invited to behold the world and all of life as a gift, where we look at giving and receiving as a cycle of reciprocity. And so we'll, uh, I want to share with you a video that is part of uh, a walk in nature that she presents to people, and this is uh, in the springtime, but I think we can relate to it. things that I love about spending time in in the woods is that when you start to become really attuned to all the beings that are around you, you realize that they're here for a reason. You can look at the woods and and start to see stories that are present in, in the woods. Bonjour! In our beautiful Potawatomi language, I've introduced myself. I am Robin Wall Kimmer, um, Anishinaabe woman, um, member of the Bear Clan and of the Eagles, um, and member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. I am a professor of environmental biology at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry uh, here in Syracuse, New York. I'm a botanist, a plant ecologist, and, and also the director of the Center for for Native peoples and the environment. I chose for us to meet here at the Clark Reservation State Park in Jamesville, New York, because at this time of year when snow has just begun to melt and spring is thinking about arriving, this is one of the best places to see those first signs of spring. 
you know, right here it comes to mind. We're walking on this path, and this little evergreen vine here, you think, oh, well, yeah, that's nice, some green on the ground. But in fact, this is telling us a story. This, and you can see the way it's, it's uh, just one patch of this. This tells us that this was an old home site. Um, this is a, a little periwinkle vine. It's an exotic species, doesn't really belong in the woods, and yet, it's part of the story of the place because it's telling us that uh, there were people here before who valued this plant and they put it here and it has, has survived. The park was made here because it's spectacular geological formation. This is beautiful limestone ledges and sculpted pavements of limestone where the glacier passed over here and created a huge waterfall which created the lake, scoured out the limestone, and there's so many plants that love to live on that that damp limestone so it's a it's a favorite place of mine to come and teach and come in and watch the unfolding of the season you look around you and it's it's not just a an assemblage of of of, of trees and green things but but it's a, it's it's a whole story you know as I'm walking around here I do love to pay attention to the little things but this time of year when there aren't any leaves out and the flowers aren't up yet you get to really see all of the textures and colors of the place you know back here is a, another tree that's telling a story look at this this is a shag bark hickory right here with those great big platy bark on it and you know when you see that you know something about the history of this place it's nuts which are delicious only grows in bright sun in open places so this tells you that this is not an old forest this is a young forest coming back from some kind of, of disturbance it also tells you when you see um, uh, shag bark hickories this is the place to be in the fall delicious food um, from the hickory nuts a really important traditional food of indigenous peoples in this uh, uh, habitat So, I am going to probably put my hat on and go back to Kelly. <laughs> Today, so what's your connection to where she teaches? So, our son Tanner goes to um, SUNY ESF, Environmental Science mm -hmm. and Forestry School, mm -hmm. and he is studying um, environmental science. Yeah. So, I wonder if he knows, so you're going to have to ask. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I had to. <laughs> I just thought, oh, yes, Tanner. But it's a really powerful message about the connection to the earth. And incidentally, yesterday we had Wild Church at Genesee County Park, and Maureen Adams uh, told us one of the, when we were doing the sharing time, she uh, brought a hickory nut, and she found one. She was so excited because she was going to use it in food. Uh, and I said, what, what do you do with it? And how do you even recognize? It was my first time to actually see it in nature like that. But she, when she described it, it uh, made a lot of sense about the stories of the land and, this, and the gifts of the land. So the invitation is to look at of all the resources of our lives, whether it's neighbors that come to your rescue when you need help or people that say, you know, we want to help someone find a job, find the resources they need, or it's just the abundance of nature. It's all around us. The gifts are so amazing. The love that God has given to us is just beyond measure. Our work is to believe it. Amen. So I invite you to uh, join with me in singing hymn number 554. Uh, let all things now living think, uh, sing with that invitation to really celebrate all the abundance of God's uh, creatures and creation.
As you go from this place, may your life be filled with thanksgiving each day as gratitude grounds you in the sufficiency of life. May God's grace give you all that you need to overcome the illusion of entitlement and to see everything as a gift. May Christ's generous love help you to overcome any greed and to share generously what you so generously receive. And peace be before you, peace behind you, peace above you, peace beneath you, peace at your right, peace at your left, peace within and all around you, this day and forevermore. Amen. Please turn to your neighbors and share the peace of Christ.